All right, hello and welcome and thank you everybody for showing up today. This is so cool of you to come out here. I know there's a lot of things you could be doing in an exhibit hall and you chose to come here, so thank you. And uh, I'm here to chat with you a little bit about my artwork, which is featured in this new book, which uh, I thought I'd mention. You are part of a national tour where I'm letting folks know about this new book. And here we are in Schaumburg, Illinois. And another thing you might not be aware of is that the grand realm of Schaumburg was in danger last night. And uh, it is only thanks to the bravery of a one knight, Sir Owen Clater, who uh, held the realm apart from uh, evil doing, and it is because of him we are here today. So anyhow, uh, thank you all for showing up today. Uh, we made it here from last night. I'm glad you made it here after last night. So let's get into it. Uh, I thought I'd let you know a little bit about what you're in for today. I'll talk a little bit about who I am, and I'll follow that up with a path that I took to make my new oversized hardcover art book that's called One Bite at a Time. Then I'll tell you a little bit about that book, and then we will go into some question and answer period in case you have any. So let's get started with that introduction. So um, as MG mentioned, I'm Ryan Clater. I'm a university professor and a comics artist. So why don't we start with that first one? Uh, I'm a university professor, and here's the business card to prove it. <laughs> I teach at Michigan State University, and I teach the comics studio classes there. I feel really fortunate to do that. I'm also the person behind spearheading the comic art and graphic novel minor course of study at Michigan State University. And we've also got a number of different comics resources around campus. I'm the director of the Michigan State University Comics Forum, which has been running for 15 years at this point. Something that I'm very proud of. Thank you. Very proud of what my skeleton crew and I have managed to keep going for 15 years. Uh, we have different award-winning cartoonists coming every single year to campus. So uh, if you're ever in the Michigan area, let me know. We've got some exciting stuff going on there. I'm also the producer and host of the MSU Comic Art and Graphic Novel Podcast, where we interview different award-winning cartoonists as well. And we are home to the MSU Special Collections Library, which is behind this unassuming glassed-in door uh, where you can go to the reading room, but what you may not know is that underneath that floor in the basement of Michigan State University sits the largest public collection of comic books in the world, anywhere ever, and it's at Michigan State University. And it's hard for me to mention this world-class resource without also mentioning in the same breath this man, Randy Scott, who made it his life's work to accumulate the world's largest public collection of comic books. So uh, Randy spent 50 years of his life making this and just retired recently as of last year. Uh, thankfully, MSU has decided to replace him. We have uh, another comics bibliographer, Jason Larson, but uh, it's because of Randy that we have this. So that's a little bit about uh, what I do in a university and a professorial capacity, but I'm also a comics artist in my own right. So um, back a little over 20 years ago, uh, this whole comics thing started for me when I did an internship at Marvel Comics in New York City. And while I was there, I was filtering around to the bullpen, learning industry technical standards. Uh, I worked with the last in-house letterer there. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but all talent at all comics companies is farmed out. Nobody is like in an office anymore. So I felt really fortunate to work with Dave Sharp, the last in-house letterer. There's also uh, a lot of other departments that I filtered around to and just learned an absolute ton about comics. And it was after that summer that I started self-publishing my own work in comics under the moniker Elephant Eater Comics. And I understand that it's a very strange name for a comics company. And I get a lot of questions about why, why Elephant Eater Comics. And it's based on a saying that my dad told me and all my siblings as we were growing up. He'd say, well, it's like eating an elephant. You just do it one bite at a time. And before you know it, you're done. So I always think about that when I have big tasks in front of me, like making books or going through school or raising a family. And just kind of keeps me grounded and, and pays tribute to my pops too. So uh, these are my very 
first comic books. They were all hand folded, hand printed, hand stapled, hand delivered to comic book stores. And they were produced in runs from anywhere between 200 copies to 800 copies a piece. And they were autobiographical comic book strips. So strips about my life. And to my surprise, when they sold out, people wanted more. So I compiled these books into a collected version and continued making books for the next 20 years or so. Suffice it to say, I'm not going to go into each and every one of these books. Uh, we've, we have a time limit here, but <laughs> I do want to touch on a couple more recent books, but we'll come back to that after I shift gears for a moment here to talk about how I parlayed some of my acquired skills in making comics into other creative avenues, such as illustrations for hire. So this is a logo design that I did for Stern Pinball for their 30th anniversary a number of years back. And things like this parlayed into other uh, avenues for me, like working with Todd McCulloch, who we all know and love, an uh, NBA player and pinball enthusiast. And I've even made work for uh, the World Championships of Pinball. In addition to illustrations, I've also designed a number of neon signs. And these neon signs have taken form of uh, signs that go into people's home game room to exterior double-sided flag signs that you see here and all sorts of stuff in between. It's just been an absolute charge working on these neon signs and such an intricate, interesting design puzzle to solve. In addition to the neon signs, I've also designed watches. This is the very first watch I designed for London-based company Mr. Jones Watches. It's called Step Right Up, and uh, it's a you know turn-of-the-century carnival shooting gallery, and the ducks along the top row are the hours, and the targets along the bottom row are the minutes. And when this was released, it sold out in record company time. They released their watches initially in batches of 100, and it sold out in two hours, uh, never to be sold again. But when this happened, the company came to me and basically said, that was real great. What do you want to do next? And I said, well, I kind of like this pinball thing. What do you think about doing a pinball watch? And they said, yeah, let's make that happen. And so this was the second release with Mr. Jones watches. Uh, it's called Ricochet and it's got a triple gilded watch face. So each one of those robots is gilded in gold, silver, or copper. And then, you know, about a gajillion colors individually printed on the glass of that watch. And then the score reels in the back glass uh, serve as the time telling device. So this beat Step Right Up's company record selling out in 30 minutes flat. And because of that, it was reissued into their permanent collection where it's still available today. And because of the demand, we were even able to produce uh, what they call an XL version. Yeah. So the XL version is a little bit larger, fits a little bigger wrist. We were even able to fit an additional robot on the watch face, which I was really excited about. Uh, so that's some other stuff I've done with my uh, skills in uh, comics as well. So coming back to the books, as Mick mentioned at the beginning, I've also produced a book with my best bud, Nick Baldridge, called uh, Coin Op Carnival. Now, Coin Op Carnival is a 64-page illustrated magazine about coin-operated amusement devices from the electromechanical era. So essentially, yeah, Jerry, real quick. yes. Awesome. Thank you, MG. I, it's true. I, I'm not even paying people to say this, but thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I, I appreciate that, guys. So it sounds like you might already know that this illustrated publication features stuff like uh, an interview. Uh, by the way, this is my co-writer and best bud, Nick Baldridge. We created this together and uh, I illustrated the whole thing. And inside you'll find things like an interview with the most prolific pinball designer of all time. His name is Wayne Nyans. And we've also got game reviews, tech segments, product spotlights, paper craft models, letters columns, just a ton of stuff jammed into 64 pages. This was such such a labor of love and we're so proud of how this turned out in addition to all this it even has 
full-blown comics like you see in the introduction on the left and in the Wayne Leaves Western story at the right, detailing Wayne's move from Western Equipment and Supply Company, moving over to Gottlieb, where he worked the next 40 years of his working career. Uh, we were also really surprised and delighted to uh, be recognized for this work uh, by the Small Press and Alternative Comics Expo, who gave us their top prize, first place in the graphic novel category the year this came out. Uh, we also got a couple of other industry nods, like the Topio Awards for uh, um, the best pinball publication that year. Uh, we did not win. It was a uh, nomination, but it's an honor to be nominated. And uh, yeah, <laughs> we have the winner right here. Thank you. <laughs> And we were also nominated for the Ringo Comic Book Industry Award. Uh, following up Coin-Op Carnival, I made a book called A Hunter's Tale. And A Hunter's Tale was originally a poem about empathy that was written by my late grandfather over 40 years ago. And this poem has been in my life as long as I can remember. This is a photograph of my grandfather and me in 1985. The poem was written in 83, so this was just a couple years after my grandfather would have written this. And uh, this has always provided some solace for me in times that were difficult. And over the course of the pandemic, I found myself revisiting that poem. And I've always wanted to make this visual in some way, because it's a very a very narrative poem and a very visual poem. So uh, over the course of the latter half of 2021, I did just that. I took my grandfather's words and I uh, adapted it to comic book form. And in the start of 2022 on New Year's Day, I launched a Kickstarter campaign for that book and it did pretty well. And this is not a humble brag or to toot my own horn, but it's to say there were a lot of folks that wanted this book, and because of that, it provided a whole lot of fulfillment work for me afterward. So what you're looking at are the 315 envelopes and 39 packages, which absolutely stuffed my local mail carrier's truck. And again, I mention all this to say, after this experience, I was pretty exhausted. <laughs> so at that time, I was kind of trying to figure out a way to get my artistic hand moving again. And so I started doodling these little sketches in the corner of my sketchbooks, and I would mirror these around a few times, and they'd end up looking something like this. And I honestly wasn't thinking much of these at the time. I shared them with my patrons. I also shared them with some uh, folks on my email list, but I wasn't putting them out publicly. And I started getting some reactions saying, hey, when's the book coming out? And I said, what, what, what book are you talking about? Because I'm not working on a book right now. And they said, these mirror drawings, these are great. I'm like, they are? They're just little doodles in the corner of my sketchbook. And so anyway, when more than one person comes to you and says the same thing multiple times over, <laughs> it might be time to start listening. So this was my surprise book in 2022, Mirror Drawings. And uh, this book features both a photograph of these corner sketches and the mirrored versions all at once. And uh, it essentially functions as an interactive art book. Each one of these pages are black and white, but they're printed on a really substantial paper stock so that you can interact with them in terms of colored pencils or markers or crayons or even watercolors. I've, I've watercolored these pages too and they hold up. Um, and these pages just kind of ranged from figurative to more abstract, just depended upon what uh, was coming out of my pen that day. And this brings us to the point where I'm gonna talk about the path that I took to create this new book one byte at a time. Now, all that stuff I mentioned, it's all seed information. It's gonna come back, a little bit of foreshadowing. So storytelling stuff, here we go. <laughs> so you remember Coin-Op Carnival that I mentioned just a bit ago. Well, over the course of 2019, Nick and I toured this book the best that two working dads could. And it was actually right here at Pinball Expo, the last stop of that tour, where I was sitting in my booth, there was a bit of downtime, and I remember thinking, man, 
we created this book. It's been two and a half years. I, we've been working on this. Um, and here we are in 2019 at Pinball Expo. And I've been doing this comics thing for a while, since about 2004. So what is that? I've been doing that uh, one, carry the three, 74, 76, 15 years, and I didn't even do anything about it? Why did that happen? So it was at my booth at Pinball Expo five years ago that I vowed, okay, that's it. I've got to make some noise about my next milestone anniversary in the far and distant future of 2024. So <laughs> at that time, I was trying to think of a way to celebrate that. And I make comics, I make books. So I thought, well, what better way than to create a book to celebrate that? And so I came up with the idea of making an art book. And I remember going out to dinner with my dear sweet wife and uh, I was very excited about this idea. And I said, hey honey, uh, 20, 2024, uh, I think I'm gonna do an art book, you know, featuring 20 years of my work. Um, what do you think? And I remember her response. Uh, she said, uh, why? <laughs> and my uh, I, celebration, 20 years, it'll be great, right? She's like, nah, I, I don't get it. Like, what's the purpose behind this? Why are you doing this? And so I'm so grateful for having a wife that is so honest with me <laughs> because it really forced me to hone the purpose for the work itself. And I'm a professor, I'm a teacher. I come from a long line of teachers. It's kind of in my bones. And so the book itself has a really heavy theme of process that runs throughout. So every single piece in there has some behind the scenes imagery showing how each piece came to be, explaining that process. So moving forward, I started to work on this book and uh, one of the first pieces I laid out in the book itself was this neon sign that I made for our home arcade. It's something that I'm just incredibly proud of and so grateful to have in our home. And when I first illustrated this and first designed this sign, I thought, okay, I'm gonna do this neon. I'm never gonna be able to do this again in my life, so I better design it to the hilt and because uh, this is my last time I'll be able to do it. So when I did that, so this is a spread from one byte at a time showing a little bit of the process of the different iterations it went through. Um, I did not just make these eight iterations. Every single one of these iterations had multiple, multiple, multiples of additional iterations on top of it. And so I started trying to lay all these out. And again, these aren't even all four design or all eight designs that I showed you in that spread. But I tried to start laying this out in a way that made some sense and gave a little bit of didactic information about each one and still had a bunch of stuff piled up on the side. But I was really excited about this art book idea and I presented this to a friend of mine and I said, hey, art book, 20 years, what do you think? Here's the first spread. And again, his reaction was like, I don't know, Ryan, this is, this is a lot. I would not intake all this, <laughs> it's too much for me. And that was another really key piece of information leading to this book to make it more presentable and more accessible to a wider audience. So I pulled back on the number of uh, iterations that I showed and really dialed down the amount of text so that I have essentially a feature image on the right and some uh, process work on the left and occasionally I'll have an additional image where the piece uh, finally rests. So that kind of set me on a trajectory of, all right, now I have kind of a uh, template to work from for this book so that again, hero image on the right, process images on the left, but it never just arrived at this point easily. <laughs> so to start with, uh, there's some photographic work going on here and I kind of had to teach myself studio photography for this and it looks nice and museum quality in the book, but if you pull back that camera, it's not very glorious. So you see a couple of my pinball machines, which are holding up this, it's a shipping box. I was doing most of this during the pandemic. And so we had lots of cardboard boxes coming in, cut out the sides to make some, uh, you know, scrim on the side so it could kind of diffuse the light, got some desk lamps, piled those things up inside with a sheet of poster board to eliminate that seam. And then you'll see the final product on the bottom left here. 
but then I still have to piece this page spread together. So you can see me attempting different things where on the top, uh, on the middle left here, there's a couple pages kind of tiered together. I was trying to do this staircasey thing. It just wasn't fitting with the text I had there. So again, just kept it simple, pared that text way down and even increased the size of the feature image on the right so that it became the actual size of the final printed book itself so you can see it at actual size in the book uh, which was really important to me I wanted this book to be uh, a really authentic reproduction of many of these objects so I tried to make them actual sizes as much as I could and just to show you a bit more of the process of this, so here's uh, an image of a tour that I did in 2008 uh, where I was moving from California out to Michigan and where I still live today. And when I did that, uh, I thought, well, why not stop at a few comic book stores along the way? I made a tour out of it. But when we talk about the spread in this book, you can see, all right, well, here's the setup in my basement. I'm holding that uh, postcard because it was really important for me to feature the physicality of a lot of this work. They're not just pixels printed on a page, but these things have become physical, like in the terms of neon signs or watches or postcards or what have you. And so I photographed myself holding this and thought, well, my thumb's gonna go where there's not a lot of art. But then when I tossed that in a page, it overlapped the inks and that wasn't really suitable. So I figured, well, maybe I'll hold it in a different way, toss that back on there. But when I did, when I compared it between the actual physical piece and the printed pixels, the colors were off. So I had to do a little more Photoshopery to make that a reality. Essentially taking this, uh, pulling apart my hand, overlaying the pixels on top of the photograph, then taking that photograph underneath and altering the color a little bit so that the shadows would represent in a correct way, and then placing that and now the final page has color corrected postcards, uh, regardless of whether it was a photograph or whether it was printed pixels. So there's a bit about the interior, but I thought I'd also pull back the curtain on the book itself, one byte at a time, which is featuring 20 years of my work in comics, illustration, and design. And what you may not know is that the title for this book was not always one byte at a time. Uh, it started out being called The Art of Ryan Clater. And uh, I had a meeting after doing a lot of different uh, sketches and design work. And you'll see here in my sketchbook how I start working with thumbnails. There's various iconography like pinball machines and neon bending and watches that I hope to include into the title itself. Uh, even a bunch of different fonts for the number 20 so I could figure out uh, the design sensibility for this. And moving forward, I thought, okay, I think I've got what I want and took some of these sketches and digitally pieced them together and tried to make this conglomeration of artwork where I had a lot of these elements, uh, visual elements incorporated into the title itself. Uh, I tried to mock it up on a book, uh, played with some different colors, and originally my thought was to have a die cut cover, which is a fancy printer term for saying a hole cut in the cover, to reveal the number 20. And when you open the book, you would see a sequence of numbers, one through 20, and there's a little icon on that number one representing the idea was to include some milestone work from each year illustrated next to the number and then when you got to the number 20 that would be revealed on the cover itself um, that did not happen because uh, i was very interested in having a cloth bound cover which i'll talk to you about in a minute here but uh, basically you can have a cloth bound hardback book you can have a die cut hardback book but you cannot have both you've got to choose one because if you die cut fabric that's going to start fraying on the edges over time and look like doo-doo. So uh, I had to make my choice and I chose fabric binding. So this idea is another one that kind of fell by the wayside. Now, I mentioned the title of the book was originally The Art of Ryan Clater. 
And I had this uh, strategy call with sort of a comics and crowdfunding uh, guru. His name is Tyler James. And we were talking about my upcoming project, this art book. And he's like, well, what's it called? You know, pitch me your book. And I told him the title. And he's like, well, how wed to that title are you? And I said, well, I mean, I've still got time. Things are malleable. What are your thoughts? And he's like, well, it sounds like an amazing book. But if I'm not a Ryan Clater fan, if I don't know who you are, I'm probably not going to pick up that book. So, like, is there anything else you could call it? So that kind of sent me into a, a bit of a creative tailspin. But I started talking with my great buds, Nick Baldridge, and also Don Walton of the Pinball Podcast, you may remember. And it was in one of these conversations where we were brainstorming together, and Don said, one bite at a time. And I lost my mind. I could not believe we had not thought of this before. When Don said this, it was just like, okay, we stop. That's it. Like, there's no more brainstorming at this point. It was always meant to be. So uh, I credit Don a lot for uh, coming up with a title that was meant to be. So uh, I started uh, sketching all over again and then started piecing these together. And even once I did this, I'm moving things around and trying to get hierarchy just right. And, oh, yeah, I forgot my name, so let's include that too. <laughs> and I would print this out and hand ink everything in order to make that title image. But even at this finalized stage, you can still see, oh gosh, can you see that? There's sort of a paste up of the number 20 there. And underneath that number 20 used to be something a little bit different. As I mentioned, I was trying to squeeze all these different interests of mine into the cover and I tried to represent the number 20 in sort of a bent neon uh, type of font. When I saw it in the end, I just thought, man, that just feels really incongruous with the rest of the design. So ended up pasting over that, making this the finalized version, mocking it up, sending this to my printer so that they knew exactly how uh, wide that uh, second cloth binding should be. And now we have a completed book. So... Um, Jumping ahead a little bit. We don't have a completed book yet because it's 2022. I'm still working on it. Uh, so it was during this time when that surprise book came about, Mirror Drawings. And when I was originally conceiving of this book, I thought, well, I, I didn't think this was going to be a book, but I guess it's going to be now. And I'll just make it a soft cover book like every other book I've ever made before. <laughs> but it's 2022. I'm smack in the middle of making this art book. I know that I've got this big, beautiful hardcover on the horizon, but I've never designed a hardcover book before. So maybe, just maybe, I can use this surprise book as an opportunity to learn some stuff about hardcover book production before getting to this milestone project and learning on that. So uh, I started conceiving of this hard hardcover book. And you can see me around the internet and different forums asking about things like, hey, does anybody know about affordable short run hardback book printing? And I started doing what I do at the beginning of every project, which is to make a ton of spreadsheets trying to figure out costs of items, what can I make, what do I think uh, my existing audience might be uh, up for, uh, what will they purchase, what's too expensive, what do I not want them to buy that's you know too many pages or too big. Uh, so I went through this and tried to figure out, can I do this hardback book thing? I ended up deciding on a particular printer and did some sleuthing and found a couple of books that they had printed in hardback form. Now, these books I'm going to talk to you about in terms of the construction of a hardback book. Uh, the one on the left is called Toddler Apocalypse. It's edited by George O'Connor. And the one on the right is How to Think When You Draw, which is one of the best-selling art books of all time by a guy named Lorenzo from the UK. And they're both hardback books, both printed by the same printer that printed mirror drawings, but they're bound in a different way. So I'm, I'm about to get real deep in the nerd book talk here for just a moment because I thought that this was really important leading into One Bite at a Time. So starting off with Toddler Apocalypse, this book is glue bound, which means you basically have a bunch of individual sheets of paper and then they're slathered with a bunch of glue on one side and that's what holds it together. Wrap a cover around it and you've got a hardcover book. 
Now, that is good in terms of economics. It's pretty cheap to print a glue-bound hardback book. So I thought, well, that's how I'm going to print my mirror drawings book. That's how I'm going to print my uh, one bite at a time book. But when I got this copy, I found out, oh, wait a minute, uh, this book can only open so far. And it, it's hard to see on this shot, so I'll try to move the camera down a little bit here to show you. This is the maximum amount this book can open. You know, it's like the top of my hand, so what is that, like three or four inches off the ground. And if I push down the cover, the back would come up, or if I push both down, it would crack the spine. So I knew for mirror drawings, I did not want that to happen because I was marketing this as an interactive art book. You know, people can draw and color in here, and you can't do that if the book doesn't lay flat. So I knew, okay, I need to find another solution, especially because with glue binding, it also kind of like eats part of the image on the book. You know, it doesn't let it open fully. So the other book I mentioned here is Smith Sewn Bound. So with Smith Sewn Binding or Sewn Binding, essentially you have a lot of different signatures and a signature is a fancy word for a lot of pieces of paper folded in half, put into a group. And when you put all these groups together and sew them together, then that makes a book. So if you crack this book open and look inside one of those signatures, you'll actually see it is physically sewn together. And that is what allows the book to lay open flat. So this was a huge lesson for me in hardback book printing and manufacturing and binding. And that basically sent me back to the drawing board saying, okay, well now I've got to create more spreadsheets and more spreadsheets and more spreadsheets to figure out if this is even possible. Long story short, it was possible for mirror drawings and I made sure it was possible for my next book, One Bite at a Time. Because again, this is 20 years of my work in comics, illustration and design and I really wanted this to be a prestige object. So, the book itself, it's here, it's physical, it's in the now. Uh, I ran a crowdfunding campaign for it and I know that's a dirty word in pinball, but it's not a dirty word in comics. So I just want to assure everybody that a pre-order model is not necessarily a bad thing if you know and trust the folks that are doing it. So I've been doing this for 20 years. I've spent a long time trying to build up trust with my audience. And so I'm very happy they were willing to come along on the ride because if they didn't, I would not be able to make this thing I'm about to show you. It is very fancy. <laughs> so <laughs> let's get into this. Um, so I mentioned some of these books that I've made in the past and that I'm reprinting some of my comics, but it's not just reprinting the interiors of the book, it's actually, showcasing them with this museum quality photograph and including some of that process imagery that I've mentioned before. So on the left you'll see a number of different blue line thumbnails that I went through to make the cover design. On the bottom left are the final pencils, then inks, and final image on the right. Uh, the other color image you see there is actually a second cover that I made for it, which I never do for my books. I never take multiple covers to complete fruition. And this one I did because the project was so near and dear to my family. You know, this was my dad's dad's poem. And so I presented these to my dad and my mom and said, hey, what do you guys think? And, uh, you know, ultimately we printed the cover that they were most comfortable with and uh, the rest is history. So uh, there's also other books in here like Coin Op Carnival where I'll again pull back that creative curtain and show you the creative process for how this book came to be but there's also a number of different illustrations like my work in pinball for different pinball events and podcasts and companies. And uh, here's the Papa World Championships. And uh, Robert and Kathy were kind enough to send me a photograph of Robert with his, uh, his winning shirt on as well. Uh, I'm really glad to include Robert in this book too. So thank you, Ganyos. <laughs> Um, there's also the neon work that I did, and when you get to this section, you start to see how I will work with a client. So on the left-hand side, you'll see a number of sketches that I'll present to the client saying, hey, we, we could make something that looks like this or this or this. And once the client chooses one of those options, we'll move forward with a number of different color comps. And once one of those color comps are settled on, we move forward with final fabrication of the product. So you see the product and where it ultimately hangs. 
I mentioned that another important thing for me with this book was to showcase the physicality of these pieces. And so often you'll see um, these big double page spreads really allowing you to get into the nitty gritty and close up with these pieces. Uh, because again, it's not just printed pixels. These are bona fide gas and glass neon signs that uh, you know were, were bent and rot in fire. So I, I want that to be apparent. Um, I also show my watches and some of the process, like that, that top left image there, that sketch is something that I, I never showed anybody before this book. It was just too, too poopy to show anyone, even Mr. Jones watches. So before I proposed this design to them, I refined it over to the right. Uh, and you'll also see uh, me in my, my studio wear, my sweatpants there. And that reference photograph is because uh, one of my artistic limitations is I have a difficult time drawing foreshortened limbs, like long things pointing at you, like breaks my brain. And so uh, when I had that guy with the, the shooting gallery rifle, I had to figure out what those limbs were doing in space. So that's a photographic reference moving forward to those final printed discs. And I even take it way back to my grad school days where I was making things like interactive games uh, that were illustrated. So you can see the uh, run cycle of the protagonist, the uh, comic book artist with uh, questionable fashion sense <laughs> and his uh, socks and sandals running around with a comic book, interacting with various folks around this looping environment who all say, mildly dis disparaging things about the medium of comics. And the secret of this game is that every mildly disparaging thing that's said about comics in this game was actually said to me in real life. <laughs> so this was like my, my opportunity to kind of work through some of these passive aggressive sentiments about a medium that's really important to me. And at the time they kind of, you know, knocked me on my heels and I didn't really know what to say. But, you know, working through this, I was able to think about, well, if I had it to do over again and I could educate them in a respectful way, what might that look like? And so again, that was uh, a, a game that I made in grad school. And because process is so important in this book, I've also included a number of scans of my original artwork leading to some of these pieces, like the Wayne Nyans page you see here. And if we look a little closer, you can see these are really high resolution scans that show not only the artwork, but also the original pencils that were laid down first and are a little bit different with the inks, the multiple ink strokes, this texture of the page. But I did not just print this on the page, I printed this and then asked the printer to die cut a number of holes in the page to reveal the final colored piece behind it so that you can see the before or the original artwork or the after in the colored piece or the before and after at the same time as you see them both through one another. So that's just one of many specialty formatting options that exist in this book. Uh, another one is this sheet of vellum. Uh, I mentioned one uh, of my many artistic limitations and I'm gonna tell you another secret one right now is that I have a hard time drawing interlocking objects. And what has more interlocking objects than a pinball machine? <laughs> so when I tried to illustrate this, this really took me quite a while to figure out. And when it was you know, coming to fruition, the only way I could wrap my head around making these ramps was to illustrate them on a separate sheet of tracing paper. So that's how it existed in reality. When I reprinted it in the book, I wanted that to be as authentic as possible. So I asked my printer, hey, can we print this on a sheet of vellum and overlay it? Can we get that to register just so, so it lines up with the artwork behind it? And you see the result here. Another specialty format formatting option is uh, are, are some gate folding pages. So you see a couple of vertically gate folding pages here. And uh, initially on the right hand side of the page there, you saw an MSU comics forum poster that I illustrated. 
when I originally illustrated that poster, it was 18 inches wide by 24 inches tall on the original artboard. So these pages fold out to show you that original art at the original size. Uh, and then there's a horizontally gate folding page as well. These are a bunch of pancakes that I illustrated <laughs> for my son over the course of the pandemic. So, um, you know, it was in some of those early pandemic months that I was trying to figure out a way to give my son something to look forward to. And I can't look in the audience because he's here. <laughs> oh my gosh. So, um, I made one of these at one point and uh, set it down in front of him and you know his mind exploded. So uh, this kind of became a weekly tradition for us and uh, every Saturday we'd make a different pancake and uh, this really became a fun tradition not only for our own family but also I started posting these online and people started to expect these every week and on the rare occasion that I would not post a pancake I'd hear about it, like, hey, where's today's pancake? My kid needs it, needs their pancake. <laughs> so uh, this is a really uh, fun exercise over the pandemic and kind of kept us sane too. So that's a bit about the interior of the book, but I haven't even talked about the exterior, which is also very fancy. In fact, it has dual cloth binding. I'm not sure if you can tell this or not, but it's actual cloth that wraps the book. It also has dual foil stamping on the front spine and back cover, in addition to copper gilded page edges to match the cover, built-in ribbon bookmarks, and it goes on and on. I won't bore you with all the print specs, but suffice it to say, it is a very fancy book that I'm so proud of after having worked on it for five years straight. It's finally here, it's finally real. And before I take some questions and answer them, hopefully, I wanna take just a minute to give a big thank you to a couple folks out here, Martin Ayub and Jonathan Houston, who are recording all of these seminars for us and archiving them online. So thank you both Jonathan and uh, Martin for doing this. Uh, and if you are looking for me in the expo hall, I'm located right across from Stern's red carpet. If you turn around from Stern, I'm right there. Uh, and I'd be happy to chat with you if we run out of time in this seminar. Okay, so uh, if there are any questions, I am happy to answer them. So thank you for being here and being a part of my national book tour. And uh, I so appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Um, I wanted to ask, a, I wanted to make a comment and then also ask Ryan a, a question. Ryan and I have been uh, working together on various projects for a number of years myself in the support role and he is the creative. Um, I noticed you did a poster for Pinball at the Zoo, which is probably one of the nicer small shows in the Midwest, and I'd recommend that to anyone to please attend in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan. In yeah. case you <laughs> didn't know uh, what the zoo meant. But um, uh, I wanted to also mention the fact that the way that you're binding this book is very similar to a company in northern Michigan called Presscraft Papers, and I can't think of the name of the artist at the moment that uh, had recently passed away that uh, mm. she did these her books in that way. But I wanted to ask the question, um, will we see anything more for, from Coinop Carnival, please? <laughs> <laughs> my perennial question I need to answer. Will we see anything from Coin Op Carnival? Yes, we will. Uh, so um, I started work on Coin Op Carnival number two, and we were working with uh, another person who decided to pull out of the project. It was not Nick. Nick and I are still on very good terms, but that rendered a lot of space spot illustrations and pages and full-blown comics that I had illustrated unpublishable. So when that happened, that really kind of took the wind out of my artistic sails for a minute. So I said to Nick, you know, look, I, I just need a minute. Uh, we're gonna come back to this, I swear, but I'm gonna work on something else. So I did A Hunter's Tale and this book. Uh, and now that this tour is coming to an end at the end of this year, 
Nick and I are gonna start back on a couple of projects together. The first one is not Coin Op Carnival, Mick, I'm sorry, but the first one we're gonna work on is a scratch build electromechanical arcade game. We've started to document this briefly on Pennside, so you may have seen some murmurs about this, and I am the weak link in that project. Uh, Nick has essentially done the uh, electronics and build of the cabinet, but I need to finish up the art portion. So starting in 2025, that's priority number one, and once that's finished, then we're gonna start work on Coin-Op Carnival number two, so we can uh, have a different answer to that perennial question. <laughs> Awesome. So Mick's asking to uh, make sure you've got the mic before you answer or yeah. ask a question. Well, Ryan. first, obviously, I love your work. You know that. We talk. I bought lots of your stuff. So thank you for all the work you do. Thank you for coming today, Ryan. Absolutely. That means so, a lot to me. My question is, will there be more watches? <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope so, but I don't know for sure. Um, I've proposed additional designs and they have been rejected. In fact, one of the rejected designs is in the book. Um, I was making these mirror drawings I showed you up there. And again, my brilliant wife said, you know, th this would make a really great watch face. And oh, wow, that's, that's probably true, that would. So I, I started sketching and I'm like, I can see what this looks like in my mind's eye, but it looks like garbage in the sketch. So I'll just take this to final inks and maybe that'll look all right. But then uh, again, it was hard to see what was going on. Again, I, could, I knew what it was supposed to be. So I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna take this to final colors and show them the final thing. And then I think they'll be excited. And they were not, <laughs> but it's printed in the book so you can see what it would have been. Uh, but again, I have been self-publishing my work for a very long time. And uh, it's only in recent years that this collaborative effort, like Nick and I on Corn Op Carnival, and Mr. Jones Watches making these watches together, uh, Neon Signs with Josh Goodacre of the Neon Shop. Uh, these are all like really positive collaborative efforts. And so all that to say, prior to that, I wanted to do something and I got it done. And now there's more cooks in the pot, which is great because things can happen that I could not do on my own. I cannot make a neon sign. I could not make Coin Op Carnival without Nick. You know, without the power duo of Nick and I, that, that book would not be what it is. Um, but uh, all that to say, I think I wanted to focus my attention on things that I knew were gonna get finished. But moving forward, I'd like to, I have some ideas that I just need to sketch out and send their way, not in a final completed form. So hopefully I'll take a little less of my time before I get uh, hopeful approval from them. So we'll, we'll see how it goes in the future. Yeah, good question though. It's funny, my question's also about collaboration. So I got into you maybe a week and a half ago um, <laughs> with Front Up Carnival. Awesome. Um, and uh, I just wanted to ask you about uh, your collaboration with one of your closest, at least in proximity, collaborators, uh, Owen Claytor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's hear it. Was there a, a specific question about collaboration? Okay, great. Thank you, Max. So the question for YouTubers at home was, uh, how is the collaboration with your son versus collaboration with uh, different folks? Well, for one, Owen doesn't pay me. And for two, <laughs> no, it's it's such a joy to work with Owen. Uh, you know, he made his own book during the pandemic, totally of his own volition. This was not, yeah, agreed. <laughs> Great job. Um, this was not comics daddy lording over him, making this book happen. This was Owen sitting down and saying, I wanna make a book. And I, I told him, you know, if you want any help, I'm here, but he didn't need it. He made it all himself. And when he was done, he came to me and said, hey daddy, I want to take this book around our neighborhood and, and sell it. And I said, ordinarily, that would be a fantastic idea. I'd love to make that happen with you, but global pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. But 
I've got an idea. There's this thing called Kickstarter where sometimes folks will put their work online and sell it. And we did that. We put together a campaign entirely in Owen's words. Uh, go look on Kickstarter. It's all public knowledge. You can go read it. But essentially, he would tell me what the purpose of this was, and I would type it down. And uh, we tossed this up there thinking maybe a handful of people would buy it, like you know, grandma and grandpa and maybe a couple friends. And over 300 people bought this book. We socked away a couple thousand dollars for his college fund. He was able to buy some toys. Just It was such an incredible experience. And all that to say, his book is also downstairs at our booth if you're interested. Uh, but yes, it, it was, it's just such a joy to see him when he feels like being creative. Yeah, it's amazing. Thanks for being here, Max. Um, my question is, have you ever thought about making a deck of cards? <laughs> <laughs> Funny, you should ask. Uh, <laughs> so it sounds like you've got some inside information there, young man. Uh, so yes, one of my you know billions of interests is uh, artist designed playing cards, and I've always thought it would be interesting to illustrate my own deck of cards, and I've been coming up with some ideas for what that might look like. I haven't I haven't made any big strides toward that yet. So again, don't get hopes up, but that might happen in the future. Thank you for your question. <laughs> hey Ryan, we're here. So I, I picked up one bite at a time yesterday. I've only had a little bit of time with it so far, but it is just gorgeous and amazing content. I love it. Um, I'm gonna come back to your booth now to look at the rest of the stuff, because now I kind of understand more what it is. But the um, the mirror, I already forgot the name, mirror. Mirror drawings. Mirror drawings. Yep. I loved your animation that you were showing here. I know that's not going to be in the book. Have you thought about animating all of them? And what one thing I noticed in that animation, if I looked at the middle, the edges seemed to move. And I don't know if you did that on purpose, or is that an artifact, or... I... So... The animated version of that was created for a stop on my book tour that I did at a planetarium. So if you can imagine that animation blown up to full dome size, that's what it was originally created for. And uh, I worked with this planetarium tech. His name's John French. He works at Michigan State University, and he's just a very patient man for, you know, it's not just putting together a PowerPoint presentation to go on a, a big dome. You've got to program the whole thing. And I don't know planetarium code, but he does. So anyway, all that to say, we worked together. And when we tossed that on the dome and got that slight spin to it, we both just kind of sat there in awe for a minute. <laughs> like, And John was asking me, hey, do you have more of these? We could put this together into a planetarium show or just have a nice lunchtime relax for students. Um, and so anyway, that just happened. So maybe we'll do more of that. I haven't committed to anything, but it was a, a pretty big charge to see that projected like that. And I'd love to see more. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, yeah, true, true. The suggestion was thinking about VR. I think we might have time for one more question. I see there's uh, just a couple minutes left. Yep. Question for Owen, actually. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, are you interested in pursuing a career in art? Ah, pressure's on. <laughs> uh, I have been thinking about it. I've been also thinking about like other designs for books I might want to make in the future. Uh, I was working on this book that was called uh, Catman. Um, it's basically, uh, in this laboratory, they were doing tests on, like, a human and a cat, and, like, normal story, something went wrong, uh, <laughs> and it created a cat man, uh, so far, I'm, like, around eight pages into the book, I'm guessing it's going to be around 30, um, but that is my next plan, um, but I have been thinking about that, but... I'm only 11, so I still have a <laughs> long way to go. 
Well, I don't know of another better way to end this seminar. So why don't we <laughs> call it quits there? If anybody's interested, we'll be at my booth right across from Stern. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, for showing up today. I super appreciate it.